But good evening, good afternoon. Um, wherever you're joining us from, uh, we have different people joining us from all over. So we are happy to have you. This is uh, Imaj Africa, which has organized this. And we are happy to have Nizreen, uh, uh, who is here with us. Nizreen will be taking us through e-learning in higher education tools and best practices. This is the second time we are having Nisreen. She, she presented for us uh, in Arabic some time ago, and it was so great, and she's back, she has agreed to be back again. Uh, Nisreen is a computer engineer and educational technology expert, and holds a higher diploma from Edinburgh Business School. She has 13 years of experience in technology and education. She worked as a programmer for five years, and then moved to e-learning. She is currently working as an e-course manager and university program coordinator at IDRAC. So, uh, Nizreen, we are happy to have you. Please um, uh, feel free to also add something about yourself as you, <laughs> as you start. I'm going to uh, mute myself and also put off my video. So over to you, Nizreen. And everybody who is joining, welcome. Hi everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. This is Nisreen Delashte, um, computer engineer. I work as an online course manager at uh, edrock.org, which is the first um, Arabic MOOC platform uh, in the region. We're mainly serving um, Jordan, um, all the Arabic all the Arabic speaking countries in general. We have around 200 um, MOOCs, all of the content is uh, for free. I worked with a lot of universities, including MIT, Harvard, TU Delft, uh, AB, AUC, uh, most of the Jordanian universities, and many universities in the region as well. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very glad uh, for Emerge Africa for hosting me again. And I'm looking forward to be somehow useful to all of you. And thank you for giving me some of your time today to discuss the future of e-learning in higher education, maybe. Uh, if you allow me, I'll start by sharing my screen right now so we can go through uh, the topics we're gonna discuss today. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about the tools and ways to enhance the e-learning experience for mainly for higher education. These strategies and to tools will work for all, not just the education actually, it can also somehow work for uh, business development in companies, for example, or even personal development, the techniques. But uh, right now and today we're focusing on the higher education mainly. It can also be applied to higher um, like uh, schools and high schools and so on. So um, today we're gonna talk about two main uh, concepts. The first concept is what is e-learning? We're gonna discuss the definition, what's the actual need for e-learning right now and the difference between e-learning and distance learning. Uh, what are the advantages and obstacles, and what are the main e-learning e types. Then we're going to move to the uh, more applied part. We're going to talk about the learning design, uh, the objectives, Bloom taxonomy, assessments, learning activities, and e-learning tools. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I would like to know your uh, backgrounds, as I know you most probably more academic than me, what I'm going to do today is not to, to explain the academic part. I'm just going to talk how to use that academic part and reflect it in a way that hurts the e-learning. Okay. Uh, after that, we will have a small discussion about the higher education during COVID-19 pandemic and how will it be after the COVID-19 pandemic is over, hopefully soon. And if you have any suggestions to enhance the e-learning in higher education in general. 
So what is e-learning? Uh, e-learning we also refer to as the online learning or electronic learning. Uh, it's the acquisition of knowledge that takes place through electronic technologies and media. In simple language, e-learning is defined as the learning that is enabled electronically. Typically, the e-learning is conducted on the internet where students can access their learning material online at any place and any time. E-learning most often takes place in the form of online courses, online degrees, or online programs. We might also say online activities, discussion forums, and so on. So what is the imperative need to e-learning nowadays? Uh, as we all know, COVID-19 resulted in the closure of schools all over the world. Globally, more than 1.2 billion children are out of class. As a result, education has changed dramatically with the distinctive rise of e-learning, both as distance learning and digital platforms. Research suggested that online learning has been shown to increase retention of information and takes less time actually, which means that changes caused by coronavirus might be present to survive. Even before COVID-19, there was already high growth and adoption of educational technology with global edtech investment reaching 18, almost 18 and a half billion US dollars in 2019. And overall market for online education projected to reach 350 billion by 2025. Whether it's language apps, virtual uh, tutor, uh, tutoring, videos, conferences, or online learning softwares, there has been a significant surge in use since COVID-19. In response, of course, uh, to uh, significant demand, many online learning platforms are offering free access to their services, just like um, even Zoom, Google uh, Meet, even Alibaba, and some other sites that, and startups actually, who came to life during this pandemic. Uh, the difference between online learning and the distance education. Both online learning and distance education, this distance learning requires similar learning tools. But in general, there are three main differences between online and distance education. Location, interaction, and intention. The differences in location. The key difference between the online learning and the distance learning is actually location. With online learning, sometimes called e-learning, students can be together in the classroom with the instructor while working through their digital lessons and assessments. When using the distance learning, students work online at home while the teacher assigns and check it and digitally. The differences in interaction. Because of the difference of location, the interaction between you and your students differ as well. Online learning will involve in-person interaction between the um, educator and the student or the learner on a regular basis. This is because the online learning um, is also using a blended learning techniques along with other teaching strategies. While distance learning includes no in-person interaction between the teacher and the student. However, we will likely rely on digital forms or communication as the messaging apps video calls, discussion boards, and the uh, LMS at your um, institute. Uh, the intention, the final difference between the online and the distance learning is actually the intention of the I teacher. To my Sorry? Okay. So the final distance, uh, difference between the online and distance learning is the intention of the teaching strategy. Uh, online learning is designed to be a combination of the variety of other in-person teaching methods. A supplemental way to mixing things up in your classroom. You don't need a pandemic to actually use it. Um, and a variety of learning opportunities with your student. Distance learning, on the other hand, is a method of delivering interaction solely online, not as a variation on uh, in your teaching style, which means uh, you might never know who your students are. 
um, this course might go on and on for years and years and you only recorded that one and you only provided that content once, for example. Uh, online learning is an excellent way to increase student engagement when, they, uh, when it's used as a mixed learning technology. As for distance learning, uh, it can continue without interruption, even in events such as snow days or COVID-19 or other pandemics, providing greater flexibility for students to work on their own pace and review work as needed. Uh, right now, I'm doing my master's at uh, Edinburgh Business School, and this is, of course, I started already like two years ago, uh, but it has been a delightful uh, experience. And I, even before the pandemic or anything, I was, I was happy to, to, to be able to follow up on my studies on my own base because I have a full-time job, for example, and my family and so on. So the time needed to my studies, I can actually do my studies and exams are enough on, the, uh, on weekends or at night or whatever. That would not be an option if I have to attend school every day. And that's a big advantage for e-learning for me. Okay, the e-learning advantages. Uh, it's obvious that students benefit from the possibility of self-paced learning. Uh, the ease of adding aids to the educational process, such as audio files, uh, games, videos, pictures, uh, simulations, and applications. Uh, the student chooses the appropriate environment, time, and place for learning. It's cost-effective, even if it doesn't sound like it, but it's actually cost-effective. It removes uh, geographical obstacles associated with traditional classrooms and the ability of educational material to be provided to a much larger number of learners. And uh, of course, from the faculty point of view, the ease of tracking students' performance and analyzing learning outcomes. It doesn't go without any obstacles, of course. It's full of obstacles, sadly, but uh, hopefully we're gonna see it develop. And one day we will, uh, you, will you might actually see it replacing the traditional way, not 100%, but I think we're gonna see it like the blended version of education is not going away anytime soon. So the first option. Okay. So the first obstacle is a limited method of direct assessment. There are some suggested uh, like solutions to each obstacle. This obstacle, the suggested solution by expert is to use peer feedback. The other obstacle is the possibility of the student and teachers feeling social isolation and the lack of direct communication. This is a bigger problem than we can think. It's, it, it's not only affecting the students, also affecting the educators as well. Uh, the suggested solution is to promote increased interaction between students uh, and even educators online or using interactive media. Um, the third obstacle that it requires strong self-motivation and time management skills. Whoever knows me <laughs> knows that I do have this problem. And the suggested uh, solution is to educate and train students in methods of organizing time and effort and link achievement to time yeah, controls. The fourth obstacle is the weak development of communication skills among students. The suggested solution is to group online activities that requires communication between students. Um, about the difficulties controlling inter integrity and preventing fraud, which is, you can say, this is the biggest um, obstacle here. Uh, some anti parkerism tools such as Turnitin or Examity can be used. Um, I'm sure you're aware of these tools. Um, but uh, these tools and other tools can be, can be, I can debate that they are um, game changers in this field. 
online teachers tend to focus on theory rather than practice, just like what I'm doing right now. I'm just presenting something or the educator presents something to the uh, students. This is theory. So unless we mix it with other uh, somehow practical uh, experiments or other activities, it will remain as theory. And that's one of the weak points for uh, online or distance uh, learning unless it's solved with another way. The suggested solu solution is applied project, projects with guidance and directions. Uh, of course, it's not appropriate to all disciplines, especially scientific. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot teach um, engineering, for example, or mechanical engineering, all theory, all online. You need uh, the suggested uh, way to do it is to blend it with traditional um, education or even using tools like simulations and virtual realities and so on. The technology is not acceptable or easy to use for users. This is also a big one because we cannot expect everyone to be able to afford internet. We cannot expect everyone to be able to afford the technology needed. And we cannot even um, we cannot guarantee the same, the same quality of education to everyone, although this is one of the purposes or um, this is one of the reasons why e-learning is coming. I'm sorry, I keep hearing sounds in the background. Okay, so uh, there must be like, um, I think we're going to see funds in the future, in the near future, just to make sure that the fair uh, allocation of resources to everyone is applied. I'm going to share with you a small video uh, about the experience in e-learning for one of the universities. E-learning is a flexible delivery of uh, online programs. So typically at Ulster, uh, people who are studying a fully online program will be studying for professional reasons and uh, the courses will be aligned to uh, their, their professional needs. Um, the courses are delivered fully online. There's no attendance necessary at Ulster and uh, students who choose can decide to come and graduate with us at Ulster. Um, and while the students are studying fully online, we consider them part of Ulster's um, high quality student experience. They will have access to all the facilities and services that a traditional student will have. As an e-learning student, uh, your program would be broken up into modules and each module is typically a 12 week period of study. Uh, they would start in the semester one, which would be late September, or in semester two, which is late January. Um, the modules uh, and the learning experience will be different for the courses depending on the subject area. But typically you will receive lecture notes uh, through the university's online virtual learning environment, Blackboard Learn. That will be uh, supplemented by peer-based discussions that will be guided by your tutor. Um, you also will be asked to do self-directed learning. Um, so you may uh, do blogs or wikis uh, and self-directed study and research. Um, your assessments will be delivered online, those will be scheduled, so you'll know when your assessments will be in a typical 12-week period. Some of those assessments will be individual and some will be uh, group work. Um, some of our professional body accredited courses require uh, different styles of assessment, perhaps a video assessment, um, and uh, you, you may be asked to do synchronous uh, real-time presentations for a topic such as interview skills. The average age of... Uh, uh, So uh, as we saw here, this educator uh, is sharing. Second, okay. So, um, so we have just seen a brief of, of one of the universities. Um, experience in uh, e-learning and as he was discussing the purpose behind adopting e-learning at, um, at their university and how they are handling the students and um, like engagement and assessments 
I would like to hear your thoughts, as researchers show that on average students return 25 to 60% more material when they learn online compared to only 8 to 10% uh, in the classroom. This is mostly due to students' ability to learn faster online, that's a debate. It really takes 40 to 60% less time to learn than traditional classrooms, just because students learn at their own pace and they, they don't like spend time uh, going from and back from the campus and they don't actually waste time um, doing uh, like running errands or talking to their friends and so on. So I would like at the end of the session to hear from you and uh, if you agree with this, with this debate or not. I'm admitting, but I come to participate. Uh... I'm sorry? Go on, please. No, I, I think someone somewhere is, is talking and we don't know who because everybody's muted, so just go on. Would you like to speak? Okay. I'll just go on. So, uh, designing the online educational material. Uh, ideally, it goes through four different stages. The first stage, from the academic point of uh, view, is actually formulating the learning objectives. Then, after that, that's the base, that's the, the most important uh, phase. Then we move to the determination of, or deciding on the assessments methods. How would you like to assess your, uh, the knowledge of your uh, students? Then the designing of learning material activities and um, measuring the impact um, of the course and that all phases will form the e-learning material. Learning according to Bloom's taxonomy. I think I skipped something, one slide. It doesn't matter, you're gonna find it in the slides anyway. Okay, Bloom's taxonomy, it's, uh, it's well known for all educators, of course. Uh, just as a brief, uh, it's the classification of the different objectives and skills that educators set by their students. Uh, in short, it's the learning objectives. The taxonomy was proposed in 1956 by Benjamin, Benjamin Plum, uh, educational psychologist at the University of Chicago. The terminology has been recently updated and including the following sex levels of learning. These levels can be used to structure the learning objectives, lessons, assessments, and so on of your course. As you can see, the base is remembering, which is retrieving, recognizing, and recalling the knowledge from long-term memory. The second layer is understanding, constructing meaning uh, from oral, written, graphic messages through interpreting, uh, classifi classifying, summarizing, and comparing, explaining, and so on. Uh, apply, which is carrying out or using the procedure of executing or implementing. Analyzing is breaking the material into uh, small parts, determining how the parts relate to one another and to an overall structure of the purpose. Uh, evaluating is a bit higher, making judgments based on the criteria and standards through checking and uh, criticizing. And the, the, the top one is to create, putting elements together to form a coherent or functional whole. Recognizing elements into a new pattern or structure through generating, planning, or producing. Of course, like other tax taxonomies, Plum's uh, means that the learning of the higher level dependent on, have, uh, on having the prerequisite knowledge and skills at the lower level. You will see Plum's taxonomy often displays as a pyramid to help demonstrate that um, this hierarchy. Uh, we have updated this uh, 
the pyramid into a cake style, this one, uh, the one you see in front of you, to emphasize that each level is built on a foundation of the previous levels. Uh, Plum's taxonomy is a powerful tool to help develop learning objectives because it explains the process of learning. Before you can understand the concept, before you can understand the concept, you need to actually remember it. To apply the concept here, you must first understand it. And in order to be able to anal evaluate the process, you must have analyzed it. And to create an accurate conclusion, you must have completed through the evaluation, which also conduct the analyze, uh, analyze, apply, understand, and remember. Fortunately, there are some verb tables to help identify which action verb aligned with each level of the Bloom's taxonomy. This is mainly useful for when uh, we formulate the learning objectives, which is the first step of designing the whole learning material. Uh, you may notice that some of these verbs on the table are associated with multiple uh, Plum's taxonomy levels. Uh, these are called, you can call it the multi-level verbs, which are actions that could be applied in different activities. For example, you can have an objective that states at the end of this lesson, students will be able to explain the difference between, uh, let's say, H2O and OH. This would be an understanding level objective. However, if you wanted the students to be able to explain the shift in the chemical and stru um, structure of water, this would be an analyzing level. So as we can see for different Bloom's level, we have different verbs, okay? And an example associated to it, let's take one of them. Uh, apply, for example, by the end of this lesson, uh, the students will be able to calculate the energy of project. We have the condition and we have the level of learning. Learning assessment methods, the common difficulties. The first obvious difficulty is the technical problems. No or slow internet connection and availability of devices. The uh, second obstacle you can say or difficulty, main difficulty, is the user experience. Poor computer skills, losing passwords, technical problems, and they the, the, um, the assessments might not actually measure the real level of the knowledge of the students. Of course, as educators, we're going to hear it, or administrators even, we're going to hear it all the time, like, um, oh, I couldn't open an account, or oh, I lost my password. Or This is very common. This is, <laughs> okay, as silly as it sounds, it's a big, um, it's a big difficulty. It wastes a lot of time. It wastes a lot of efforts for learners. And the cost, as discussed before, uh, the technology and the connection is not available for everyone. Not everyone can afford it. And uh, hopefully soon we're gonna, we're gonna see some movements to make sure that these resources are available for everyone. Okay, effective assessment methods in e-learning. I'm going to focus right now on the qualitative e-learning assessments method. The quantitative, uh, of course, is like the uh, multiple choice, um, check boxes, uh, true or false, and so on and so on. But right now, we're going to discuss the qualitative e-learning assessments method. Um, as we all know, the assessments are not just for giving grades, but they, are also, they also have several different functions as well. Uh, assessments can give feedback, impact students' behavior. Uh, if the uh, assessment begins early, students begin early to, uh, they can revise their knowledge, they can choose different activity or different topic, or they decide to go deep uh, within it. If, because um, 
the assessments actually, if you presented it earlier, and that's, that's why placement exams are very powerful. It will actually give the students a good idea what are they, uh, what are they about to learn. Uh, and set their expectations, or it might tell them that this is not what you had in mind. You need to switch your uh, the way of your like um, knowledge retrieving or studying as well. Uh, assessments are very useful for students' satisfaction as well. The more evaluation opportunities, the more students will become aware of their progress, and the greater their chances of being satisfied with the course. Um, and it shows credibility to stakeholders. It demonstrates the quality of education process for the job market. The qualitative learning assessment uh, methods, uh, as the name implies, it's all about quality over quantity. Rather than starting, uh, scratching the surface of e-learning course comprehension, it allows you to go in deep for an online learner's understanding. As a result, you can improve proficiency and productivity by identifying the areas of improvement. The first one is task-based simulation. Simulation test practice and experiential knowledge. Online learners must use all of their resources and skills to complete the task in a safe virtual environment. Thus, you can uh, assess proficiency without taking any real world risks. The simulation must be realistic as possible to obtain accurate results. Uh, this will include the background uh, sounds, relevant images, and e-learning characters. If the task requires software or equipment, these tools should be involved as well. You need to be able to mimic every aspect of the e-learning. This is basically very um, useful for medical students uh, or even engineering students. Um, the second one is branching scenarios. Branching scenarios involve multiple decision points that lead online uh, learners down different paths. Every choice brings them one step closer to the outcome which highlights the negative or positive pre-regression of their actions. They must, utilize, they must utilize their skills and talents to navigate the situation and overcome common obstacles. Well, since there are many branches involved, it's wise to create a detailed e-learning storyboard beforehand. Uh, this allows you to keep track of all the decision paths and main consistency. The third one is online group collaboration projects with feedback. Uh, you can also use peer-based uh, peer e-learning feedback to gather qualitative data. Uh, you can ask the learners to divide into groups and assign them a topic or prompt. They must work together to solve the problem or create, finished, um, create a finished product, such as uh, a presentation or a video or so on. The open-ended questions are one of the most simple and straightforward qualitative e-learning uh, assessment methods. However, they also allow for the most creative freedom. There are no right or wrong answers. Instead, online learners must reflect on their topic and draw their own conclusions. Problem-solving case studies uh, as a qualitative e-learning assessment technique it turns online learners into a detective so that they can solve the problem and display their knowledge. It all starts with a case study or real world example, and they can and remove the end to leave it on a cliffhanger. When you ask online learners to brainstorm solutions, they must also explain the arrival of that solution or that uh, conclusion, sorry. Online interviews, which is very common nowadays, uh, it's like face-to-face -face interviews, um, which was not possible in e-learning environment before. However, you can still conduct interviews with uh, the help of video conferencing tools. This is usually more feasible for smaller groups or one-to-one -one monitoring. 
uh, is very useful for higher education, like master's or PhD levels. Uh, it offers online learners the opportunity to address their uh, concern and provide e-learning feedback. For example, encouraging them to identify their strengths and weaknesses, then recommend supplement e-learning resources. Okay, so um, there are different or six different learning types. It's all connected to the Bloom taxonomy. I'd like you to um, join me, watch this small video so we can con connect all the dots together. If the learner is listening to the teacher or watching a video or demo or reading a If the learner is listening to the teacher or watching a video or, or demo or reading a book or website, that's learning through acquisition. It's very common in education. It creates the opportunity for the learner to develop concepts, but it doesn't require them to do anything. All the other types of learning activity do. If the learner is going to the teacher or the library or the internet to find out something, that's learning through inquiry. It's a different way of reading a book, more under the control of the learner. And they have to come up with a question, evaluate what comes back, search again. It's a more active learning process, enabling that conceptual process to keep developing. If the learner is asking questions, of other learners or answering their questions, exchanging ideas, challenging each other's arguments, that's learning through discussion. Listening and responding, articulating and arguing, they're all opportunities for the concept to develop. And if the teacher sets up a learning environment with a task goal, the learner then has to generate an action, interpret the feedback and maybe think about the relevant concept and try again to get nearer the goal. This is learning through practice. And suppose you get the students working together on a project where they have to produce a shared output, maybe a diagram or a definition or a design or report. This is learning through collaboration. It's different from discussion. Having to produce a shared output means they have to negotiate their ideas and practice until they agree. So in the process, they're challenging each other and providing peer feedback to develop the best output they can. Even more opportunities for integrating and developing concepts and practice. And finally, when students are producing something for the teacher to evaluate, that's learning through production. Again, it may be a plan, a website, a performance, a theory, an analysis, but having to produce a public presentation of what they've learned is as important as getting feedback from the teacher. Many opportunities for integrating and developing concepts and practice. Together, all six types of learning activity cover most of what you're ever likely to ask a student. So as this small video presented, there are six different learning types. Okay. So we have the Bloom taxonomy, we have six different learning types, and we can use both of them to come up with the perfect learning activities. Allow me, I'm going to share this document with you at the end of this session. Actually, Okay, so innovative activities to engage your students. How would you, how would you uh, decide on which activity to use so uh, the students can um, actually acquire the skill needed from them? Uh, I'm gonna just download this to enlarge it. 
That needs, oh, you're making it bigger. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. I'm going to share it with uh, everyone at the end. I just needed to make it bigger right now. So, okay, we have the six different learning types. Remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. This is a Bloom taxonomy. We have the verbs for it. Like for remember, the verbs are define, describe, recall, re recognize, for example. How would you assess that? Um, how would you um, make sure that this skill or this learning type is uh, done? You can use questions like, find the meaning of. This will make them try to remember something. Or can you tell me why? The activities to that is to discuss with a partner, make a fact chart, uh, come up with a clever uh, analogy, for example. Uh, we can go to something more complicated, evaluate, for example. We have conclude, uh, interrupt, support, uh, validate. If you, want, if you want to enforce this type, um, the questions would be a type of, do you think? was it good or a bad thing this will actually make the students they need the information to build over they need to understand the situation uh, discover more information about it or product um, behavior for example analyze all the content or all the uh, information and then they will be able to evaluate an activity to that would be something like writing about your own feelings, for example, or give it a name and plan a market campaign. Create, create is coming up with a final product. Um, you can ask students to work together to come up with a project or um, a presentation, or they can come up with a, uh, sorry, a research or a paper and so on. To be able to do that, they will have to go through through the whole uh, other files. I'm gonna also share with you this uh, chart or work paper. You can use every time you need that. And the how-to. Okay, back to So. Um, I would love to share with you some of my favorite tools to each learning uh, type. The first learning type is the acquisition. Uh, I would recommend the most common thing. These are not the best, but they are the most common and the best in some cases. They are available for everyone. They are easy to use and they have proven uh, success with the then students and educators with no previous um, technological background. Uh, Google Hangout, of course, um, the communication uh, tool, you can easily create uh, groups, start calls, start recording, and so on. Zoom, uh, Google Hangout is just like Zoom, but Zoom, it, you can also measure uh, the engagement by using polls or uh, you can create rooms and so on. Uh, also for acquisition, you want to present some materials. So uh, tools like uh, uh, the video editing tools will be very useful. You will find that at uh, Camtasia, PowerPoint, you can, of course, you know that you can actually create videos using PowerPoint if you just added the voiceover to it and you export the whole thing as, um, as a video. Uh, Google tools are also great for acquisition uh, because educators can share the board, Excel, slides, and whatever files they want, and students can just come back to it, read it, or listen to it later. And the video editing tools and, uh, and the sharing capabilities at Moodle, not just Moodle, any LMS system. You can say Moodle, uh, edX, uh, Blackboard, and so on. As for the inquiry type, uh, some tools like Cura, Reddit, Google, because why? Because students will need to go and look for information. Okay, so uh, this can be served as um, like a 
not a tutorial, you can say um, a reference of tools they can go, uh, they can use. Of course, this is very generic. Each topic or um, each situation requires different tools. Some tools might be actually be internal tools. The discussion part, we can use the discussion forums uh, inside each LMS, like Moodle, Blackboard, and so on, the uh, Piazza, uh, Microsoft Team, Flipgrid, Padlet, and Zoom. Uh, when I share this document with you, all these things are clickable. Let me show you an example we're going to use in a bit. It's called Padlet. Padlet and Flipgrid, actually, they are great for discussion. Uh, they are like um, boards with cards. And each student will put their own opinion there and students can vote, can reply to each other, can um, add material when needed. Okay, let me try this. No. Okay, this is an example of uh, Padlet. Actually, this is from a previous webinar. As you can see, you can divide the whole thing into uh, columns and students can start adding uh, cards. And within the card, they can, they can upload files, uh, snap a picture, or add a voiceover, draw, and reply to each other. <clears throat> of course, this, this tool is free. Another very important tool is actually Flipgrid. Flipgrid, the same thing, just almost like Padlet, but it's only video. And they can reply to each other by video. And it's, uh, it's actually provided by Microsoft. All these, all these tools can be implemented in whatever platform you are using. You can just implement it as a link if needed. Okay. This is an example of Padlet, uh, of, uh, sorry, Flipgrid. Students will upload cards and they can add effects to it. Um, and they can reply to each other by video. Of course, you can, as an educator, you will have the ability to uh, not publish the, uh, the video before you review it. You will be able to remove it at any time. Uh, Zoom, of course, is great for discussion and the uh, discussion forms, the normal discussion forms. Practice, practice. Practice here, um, we can say that, let's assume I'm a student, okay, and I have an exam coming up in a month, let's say. Practice can be something like a question bank, like a placeholder with a thousand of questions, for example, so I can go back and forth to that question bank and test my knowledge. So I will recognize my weak points and I can work on my critical thinking and so on. Some really good tools that can be used for that is Quizlet. Okay. Okay. This is a Quizlet. For example, of course, you can create your own thing. By the way, you can use uh, the uh, the available um, library, or you can create your own thing. It's interactive. It's very useful for uh, students. The other tool is Kahoot Games. This is a gamified way of learning, which which proved uh, very successful within within students. Okay. Let's check this collection. The same thing. It's um, it's like question banks in a gamified way. Um, okay. Okay, I need to sign up. I'm not playing right now. Collaboration. Collaboration is when you ask a group of students to play together, uh, <laughs> to work together actually, and come up with uh, one result as a group. They can do that, of course, on Moodle, or they can use uh, shared drives, 
or they can use a tool called Voice Thread, which is an online interaction uh, tool that lends itself to students to present and defending their work bef uh, before experts and peers. They can just work on slides, let's say, they can work on videos, and as you can see, they are defending or they are presenting their work to everyone else. It's great for business, for higher education and K-12. On your own time and days, you can go and explore these tools. Please let us know if you also recommend some other tools. I'm going to share a link in a bit. As for production, the last time, um, we can ask them to share the product, the final product or article or project via Microsoft Teams or Google Drive, of course. Padlet will, will also be great for that. Google Hangout if you need them to present verbally in front of other people and Zoom as well. Uh, there is a question, uh, Nisreen. Um, yeah. If it's possible to plug in these tools onto Moodle, or which other places can they be plugged in? Definitely. I'm going to show you actually an example right now. Let's say I want to implement this board. Okay. I can go just to share. It works for all of them, but the ways are different. The buttons are placed some other places. But it's uh, all of these tools can be implemented. Padlet, for example, you just go to share, and here. You can just grab the QR code, you can copy the link, or you can just simply embed it. You just take the, the code and you place it on um, Moodle or web page, or you can just share it as a link within groups. Flipgrid as well. I'm not logged in, but, oh, okay, I can actually log in and show you my account. Okay, I have one grid here. I can just open it, check it out from here. I have 300 responses from different people. All of these responses are actually video. Oh, let's see what she's saying, for example. She's discussing the content of the course where I shared this um, Flipgrid too. And um, people can actually vote it up, vote it down, or leave comments to her. Um, share, what's the share here? You can just grab this link and place it on your portal and uh, they will have access, direct access to this board. So Nizreen, one can, can, can uh, create one for, for, for their purpose. Uh, if, if it's a class one or whatever it is, they can create that and share it on their model or any other platform that they are using. Yes, yes. Uh, we can do that now if you want to try it. We can just add a new grant. We can call it Emerge Africa. Okay, it's a school email students. Let's say educator learning. Okay. Yeah, next. Uh, uh, you can set up a password, but it's optional. Okay, I'm gonna leave it to know right now. And that's it, simply that's it. Okay, we can just copy the code. You can see here, you can directly add it to Microsoft Teams or Google Classroom or just share it in uh, Remind. I'm just going to grab the code. And here we go. I'm going to share the link with you just to show you how um, straightforward this is.
Uh, can you see my screen again? Uh, yes, 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 we can. I just shared a link with you. You can just go on and we can start adding um, adding cards to, uh, to this Flipgrid just to try it out. And it's as simple as sharing the link. And it's, you can just add it as an iframe to whatever uh, LMS you're using or just a web page or even a link to your Facebook group, for example. I'm going to go back to my uh, presentation here. Uh, at the end of this presentation in two slides, uh, there's a link for a Padlet. We can also try Padlet here and discuss this session together. So the last two things I want to discuss with you today is the higher education during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, my slides, of course, are full because uh, I, uh, I downloaded <coughs> the whole thing for you so you can just keep it. But in real life, do not, do not just put too many words in one slide. <laughs> but right now, just look at it as a file, as a placeholder for information. So um, some positive observations came out of this pandemic. Uh, we are surprised to see that educational agencies are rapidly adopting the forced imposition of distance learning. Uh, the, the, um, the adoption of the technology and the adoption of change actually surprised everyone. We had never thought that um, this rapid adoption will take place in such a short time. Short time. But it, it only proves that under tough circumstances, um, like people adapt, people change, people just embrace the change faster than we think. We embrace the change faster than we think. So it's, this is the time to actually take prey decisions or changes, or actually if there's something in the back of your mind and just want to try with your students, this is the time. The other thing is the speed of adoption of faculty and students to the new technology style of education. Many educational bodies build future plans to adopt e-learning and create an integrated e-learning subject. Some of the lessons learned is that internet sessions between 15 and 30 minutes are more effective. Students and teachers realized how exhausted they were on screens throughout the day. Distance learning has reminded us that strong learning can only happen when we are engaged, active and focused. If it becomes a matter of filling hours, we miss the point. That's why 15 to 30 minutes are the most effective, down to the point. Uh, according to UNICEF, maintaining educational rituals with its records and moments of social interaction and having students in contact with their peers and friends psychologically important during the crisis. This question arises whether classroom roles in most students recognize the basic social and emotional needs of, of children there's a risk that by focusing on academics only, schools forget the wellness should come first. Um, as discussed, many students were left behind due to the lack of access of appropriate bandwidth or hardware or lack of preparation uh, from school, while others managed to accelerate their digital learning through cutting edge softwares, access to high performance devices and highly trained uh, teachers. This is actually digitally dividing people. This digital divide has been um, caused by the crisis and will leave gaps in learning in many children. Governments, schools should make different efforts to ensure that the systems are and infrastructure adapt the future closing off uh, to reduce this. How will the higher education be after the coronavirus crisis? Uh, of course, as, as, as we all know that the change was sudden, but it was not totally unpleasant. There are some problems that happened, but we also learned to overcome it and embrace it. And it only means that the e-learning is here to stay. And there's a lot 
of room for experiment, there's a lot of room to enhancement as well. So how will it be after the coronavirus crisis is over, hopefully soon? Um, E-learning has a promising future. Universities will use many of the lessons learned during this period of forced adoption of e-learning to enhance and uh, enlarge the scope of online learning observation. The most important aspect to focus on is to ensure the effectiveness of e-learning in the future, the integrity of the evaluation and the equipment and the access uh, to technology. There's a clear understanding of the economic hardship faced by students and directed to increase financial aid, scholarships, and flexible payments. A difficult period awaiting graduates in 2020, universities have yet to develop specific strategies to help students meet their challenges. Of course, we just spoke about that, that um, there's a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of room for uh, um, changes and lessons learned, but it's not a good year for people who are graduating in 2020. But in the future, in the future with all these trials and errors, we'll come up to something better than the traditional uh, education we're used to and it will benefit the future generations. Universities that rely on international students may want to consider creating scholarships based on need and merits as well as mixed education in partnership with regional universities. I, want, I would love to hear from you. What, uh, what do you think the biggest challenge that faces e-learning and how can we overcome it? Uh, I created this Padlet for us to try just as a hands-on um, experiment. You can also scan the code here to access the link or I'm going to share it with you right now. It's also available at um, the document I'm sharing with you. Uh, please go on and access the link just to try out the tool and please share your thoughts and ideas. I would love to hear from you. Um, this is just a Padlet. I created, I created um, some columns of topics I thought might be useful. Uh, if you have any suggestions to e-learning, how do you think we can enhance the uh, experience, challenges, case studies, useful tools, and share your own experience. Um, okay, just click on suggestion. Of course, you can sign up, so the comment will appear under your name or it will be anonymous. Let's add a card here. And from the drop-down list, you will have many different ways to add your um, material. Like I said. Uh, you can go on and do that. Meanwhile, I want to show you Padlet. It's one of my favorite tools. You can sign up for free, of course. You can implement it on your LMS or just share a link with your students. Make a Padlet. There are many. Um, <laughs> okay, Padlet limit reach. I'm gonna just delete something. Uh, Nizreen, can we find out if one of uh, any of the participants has managed to be on, has gone to the Padlet and see what the experience is? Yeah. Yes, I have some comments here. See, it's interactive. I can, you can, as an educator, control the whole thing. You can edit, you can just change the color. You can delete it because you are the admin. And that's most needed in <laughs> education institutes, of course. I'm going to leave that to you um, to share your thoughts with me, with each other. And this will be kept for future users. But right now, I would love to hear directly from you if you have any questions. 
uh, for me or um, if there's anything you want to uh, discuss, please let me. There was a question from uh, Elizabeth in the chat. Um, Moodle is data free for our students. If we plug, plug in the tools, would it still be free for the students? Yes. yes. It depends on which tool you're asking. Uh, Flipgrid is always free, for example. Padlet is free to a limit. It only allows you to create six Padlets, uh, six boards, you can say. Um, so it depends on the tool. But Moodle in general is very powerful. You can actually, the number of plugins that can be added to, Mod to Moodle is unbelievable. You can just form it the way you want. I'm sure even the tool you're looking for, you will find some, some plugin that works with Moodle. If not, you can just add it as an iframe and it will of course be free. Thank um when we uh, during your first few slides there was a question that you had posed yes yeah uh, perhaps um we can get some feedback from the floor now um and we you can feel free to to turn on your video when you are when you are speaking because we are we are so few so we can always talk you can turn on your video if your your data allows and you can ask the question directly Okay, that's amazing, but you can at any time leave your questions um, to me at the Padlet. Let's try it out. And you can also um, email me directly. Erin, uh, I'm sure she can uh, share the documents and my contact with you. And I'm available at any time. I think we have a question. Yep. I don't, um, anyone wanting to speak up, please do. Yes, please. Hi. Yes, Esther. Yo, hi, hi, hi. Go on. <laughs> hi. I actually put the comment on the Padlet as well. Thank you so much, Nizra. It's been really, really eye-opening. I'm also in e-learning and educational technology trying to, I mean, the teaching and learning unit of our institution in South Africa. Yes, and what I found is that, um, the capacity development is a big issue. So staff don't know how to use the technology and then even those staff that upskill themselves and can use the technology, yeah. the students are not able to use the technology. So how do we do that capacity development? And uh, there's so many tools as well. So that's my question. Thank you, but it was great. Ah, thank you. Uh, well. The change management is actually the second most important thing after planning because you can have all this equipment set up, you can have all the budget you want and everything, but as long as the students or the faculty do not actually believe in that or they think it's just too hard to try, it's not going to work. So change management, there are, um, there are some departments just focus, focusing on that. Of course, not everyone have that, and we don't actually need it most of the time. Uh, trainings will be very, very um, useful. Pandemics like the coronavirus is very un unfortunate, but it forced us to actually try something that we would never believe in before. So uh, to answer your questions, yes, you will need some um, change management plans. I can share that with you as well. I'm gonna add it to the package. I'm going to share with you right now, yeah. But mostly, oh, one thing that I want to share right now, uh, here in Jordan, in some universities, because the professors are not tech savvy sometimes, or they are, they're just in an age that they do not want to use technology, they're not used to it, I'm not going to use it. What they did is that they hired teacher assistants, okay, to that professor who have all the knowledge, but he doesn't have, like, uh, the tech savviness to 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 uh, to share that knowledge with uh, with their students. 
So teacher assessments, even within his or her own students, was very useful. Okay. Great. You know, Nisreen, uh, someone said that the, the current situation or the COVID situation has just exposed the inequalities and the gaps that we have in our education sector and, sure. of course, the health sector. I yeah. don't know if, if that's the case. Do you feel that that's the exposure or we, you know, there are new things that are there that are emerging? No, it's just the human nature, I would say. <laughs> We adopt much faster, much faster than we think from one point. The other thing is that it exposed some weaknesses in the educational infrastructure, if any. Okay? We were not ready for this. And the education 100% got affected in a bad way for this pandemic. E-learning was not ready, but it proved that uh, it can be, it can be manipulated Related in a way that serves much bigger role in the future, and that's what's happening right now. Hopefully, yeah. Anyone else with a comment before we close, please? Yes, Zita, please. would you like to say something? Yes, please go. Yes. Um, interesting enough, um, where I am here in Zim, uh, we have been talking about e-learning for a long time and trying to put computers there and there, yeah. but with now it has proved to be what we theorized, what we saw as if was a working you know, system or framework failed us because if you look at Zimbabwe, almost all our universities have, have stopped working. And besides using WhatsApp, because Moodle is quite expensive. I know there's a simple, there's a free Moodle that we can use for yeah. a certain period of time then it cuts off. But now isn't there anything besides Moodle that can be used like what Moodle does? Uh, Moodle, I know the setup can be expensive, but the platform itself is open source, it's free, but you, you need people to actually set it up and that's the expensive part. But you can use some like open edX, for example, it's free. Uh, oh. Some even um, websites with free, uh, what do you call it? WordPress, you know WordPress, you can have a free tool that serves as open index, for example. You can build a whole LMS by yourself in one week, for example. Um, there are, even in uh, edX.org, you can create your own portal and you can grant oh. access to your students. Yes, you can upload your lectures, your, you can build your assessments and you can add your students as virtual classrooms. It's also free. Uh, I've seen um, schools and universities they did not have any LMS. So as a quick as a quick solution, they just created YouTube channels, restricted access. They just uploaded all their content there and they created WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups sometimes, um, newsletters, and they interacted with each other without the need of having sophisticated LMS that might need time or budget to build. So yeah. Okay, so then it means um, maybe what we've been lacking is the information into mm. whatever we can, what is available for us. I teach a class of about uh, 180 students at university, mm -hmm. and I really found, uh, well, I tried using mood, uh, Zoom. Um, yeah. You'd realize there are so many of them, and it seems like our students, they really want to see the teacher. They want this, this feel that we used to have in the traditional classroom, which seems to be fading away. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, thank you for your presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, by the way, I want to say something. Uh, Google Classroom, it's free nowadays. It, it's oh, yeah. free. It's like it will serve your, your needs 100%. The only thing is it might take time, uh, it might take time, sorry, to actually approve your request. But if oh. your education institute got approved, it's an amazing tool. You need to try that. It will solve the whole thing for you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we also have a question uh, from Prinavin. Uh, uh, please comment on online assessments, mm -hmm. uh, academic integri integrity, online connectivity, reassessment, and vigilation, and so on. 
Yeah. So uh, this is the biggest weakness, weakness in e-learning, uh, which is the integrity. How would you guarantee that the exam is actually being solved by this particular student? There are the traditional or direct ways, like uh, just open the cam and talk to me one-to-one, -one. or you can ask them to write the article and submit it via Turnitin, for example, the algorithm uh, detection uh, website that will compare the article that I submitted with the whole um, content. On the internet, it will tell you that this student took 30% of the article directly from the internet, from this site and this site and that site. It will also uh, evaluate the, um, the grammar, the spelling, and so on. But for live assessments, uh, there are tools like uh, Examni, if you know that. Let me share my screen a bit, show you something. Examni. How does the Proctor exam platform make sure this is another platform, can't the Proctor cheat. exam? Using the what they do is that they actually um, you register for the exam as an educator. You uh, you put on all the information about the students, uh, and the students will go on, click the link. It will take them to the exam tier room. They'll choose the exam, which exam are they taking? Then they come. Uh, needs to be open, the mic needs to be open, and they will have to rotate the, um, the screen 300%, uh, uh, 360% uh, um, degrees, I'm sorry, to show the environment. They will need to show their ID to the, uh, to the person behind the cam uh, to just to prove that this is the same person and the cam needs to be on the whole time. And they will even detect the eye, the eye movement, the hands movement, and so on. This how somehow it can guarantee the integrity, and they will also stop you from opening another tab on something. So, uh, short answer to your question: It will be tools like Turnitin, Examity, um, or even replacing the whole uh, assessment method by something like open book exams for example, or just submitting an article or doing an uh, oral example or verbal exam one-to-one uh, -one or in front of a group or so. That might be the answer, yeah. Um, so that was wonderful, that was great. Uh, as we say from Kenya, Asante Sana, we are so happy to have had you, Nisreen. I Thank hope you. you can join us again uh, another time um, so that we can do more hands-on on, on, the, on the tools uh, that we share. Of shared. course, if you can let me know which tools exactly you're, you're, you're interested in, we can do some comprehensive hands-on uh, workshop. would be my pleasure. Oh, fantastic. Okay then. Um, I guess people will will then uh, those who are in the in the uh, you know in the webinar can give us feedback on the form that we shared. I've shared a link. You can yeah. give us feedback on a few of the tools that you'd like, and the ones that come up are the ones that we are going to you know to to ask you if you could come back and we can do a hands on on them. Uh, for now, it's a big big thank you. Uh, we appreciate you, Nizreen. Thank you so much for being here. And Most thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. Yes, we, we appreciate everybody who's been here. Yes, and thank you everyone and have a good evening or a good afternoon wherever you are. Okay, bye. Good evening.